The following interview was conducted with Professor John S. Day, the Herbert C. Craner Professor of Management Emeritus for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, October the 1st, 2009 at uh, Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. This is part two of the interview. Good afternoon, Professor Day. We'll afternoon. start uh, uh, finishing up a little bit on the Marines and then you can move into when you came to the Industrial Management Department in 1956. Okay, uh, well, uh, finishing up with the Marines, I uh -huh. stayed in the Reserve uh, and uh, got promoted and eventually retired in 1959 as uh, a bird colonel. And, of course, since then I've not had anything to do with the Marines. Uh, actually, uh, my uh, first knowledge of Purdue was when M. Wyler swooped into my office along with Ron Stuckey who was uh, at that time had transferred over from agricultural economics to be assistant uh, head of department uh, with them uh, to uh, possibly uh, uh, recruit me. And uh, M was very persuasive, and uh, to be perfectly frank, I was uh, had just uh, finished up my doctorate and was considering the possibility of some changes. And uh, <laughs> I tell my uh, uh, sons and my grandchildren that don't worry if you can't make up your mind right right after graduating from college. I really didn't decide whether I wanted to be in consulting or whether I wanted to be in industry or whether I wanted to be an academic until, nine, until I was 39 years old. So it takes a while to get things to settle down. I understand. <laughs> Just for some people like me. There you go. Well, I think I'm a lot like that, too. So at any rate, uh, I came out on Easter Sunday and uh, uh, like the people I met, uh, although the uh, uh, the uh, uh, classrooms and uh, offices were a little, <laughs> a little small. And, I love uh, that description. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, uh, we uh, we did accept. And uh, did you I, come prior to that just for to a look, and then you decided? Yes, I oh, came okay. out on Easter Sunday to take a look. Okay. Uh, uh, presumably showing up for the fall term. Okay. All right. And uh, when I get back, uh, Barbara said to me. Uh, uh, are you seriously interested? And I said, yes, I am. And she said, well, I don't know. Do you have any trees out in Indiana? It's <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> typical New England. There you go. Uh, uh, <clears throat> the uh, end result was that uh, uh, I uh, pursued a couple of other things and finally decided uh, Purdue was a place for me to go. Uh, <clears throat> I arrived. Uh, was fortunate enough to uh, rent a very lovely uh, uh, brand new home uh, about eight, uh, ten miles outside of uh, of uh, Lafayette, uh, West Lafayette I should say, and uh, uh, for a year the professor was going on leave to uh, 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 Brazil. And uh, we uh, moved without uh, much trouble, got uh, settled down and uh, I started in. In the fall, right? In the fall, right. Okay. Uh, the uh, first thing I discovered was that uh, this planned master's program, which was pretty much the, uh, uh, the dream of uh, uh, Ron Stuckey and M. Wyler. I don't think they consulted many people. Uh, and Ron had based it heavily upon his own MBA experience at Harvard. And uh, I shortly after reviewing the curriculum, uh, I said, whoop, you don't have any writing in this. And they said, well, we hadn't thought about that. And I said, well, I want to put in the what we, uh, I'm going to call a managerial policy reports, where we assign a case and at the end of the week they have to, in a thousand words or left, uh, uh, review it, analyze it, uh, come to a conclusion and recommend action. And uh, that got to be a, the most hated course in the program, as it was at Harvard by a similar course. And uh, it, it, it became a tradition, uh, namely that uh, on Saturday evening uh, when the uh, the uh, paper had to be in by a certain time. I think it was eight o'clock or something like that. Uh, the students would p postpone uh, putting the final touches on it until just before uh, eight o'clock, and then there'd be a mad dash to get it in on time. And afterwards, there was usually a beer party. But at any rate, that's right. Uh, uh, the the uh, the wives, uh, the married students, complained bitterly, and we <laughs> we we turned the turn in time down earlier in the afternoon so that they had their evening. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> uh, so the uh, the program was uh, very much based upon uh, uh, the Harvard program, 
without the uh, opportunity to have a full second year of taking elective courses. It was a completely uh, new concept uh, and then became uh, quite well known in the academic, business ac economics academic world because every time we got a chance, he told what a great program we ha had and how all the other people were out of date or words to that effect. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, as you may have gotten in some of that stuff that I sent you, uh, the original organization was it was the Department of Industrial Management and Transportation. By the way, we never did teach a transportation course. Okay. Um, and that had uh, brought over from engineering uh, a, uh, several courses in marketing and accounting that have been taught by old line type faculty members, uh, lecture type uh, sure. approaches. Uh, Which was the traditional at that time. It was a tradition at that time. And uh, they were uh, the uh, faculty, of course, uh, that was available, which both Em and uh, Ron recognized were not really the, up to the task. Mm -hmm. And so it was a, that he had gone to Harvard to bring in some people trained in the case method. And along with me, uh, he brought in John C. in accounting and Jim Parks in, uh, in uh, marketing. Jim was uh, assistant professor at Harvard uh, getting his doctorate. Uh, and John C. was working for one of the big accounting firms and was getting his stock in Boston and was getting his stock at the same time. And both of those men arrived uh, the following term. In other words, I arrived uh, in August and they arrived uh, in uh, uh, right after Christmas. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the program uh, uh, really owed its uh, fact that it was uh, at a fairly successful beginning uh, with a small number of students to Abby Stewart and the Purdue Research Foundation, who uh, made, uh, as I recall, seventy-five thousand dollars available to us for scholarships at fifteen thousand a year for five years. Wow, that's pretty good. And, well, excuse uh, me, was the faculty on the small side too at that time, Dr. Day? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, they were. Uh, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, including the people we inherited. Uh, uh, there may have been in the Department of Management. Uh, uh, three of us, um, maybe eight or ten. Yeah, that's what I would gather, even from the reading that, that I've read that you sent to me. I'd uh, estimate that, even though I'm not sure about the carryover. Well, that, that, uh, that's close enough. Uh, sure. And uh, uh, with the exception of uh, Doc Owens, uh, who actually was in the economics, uh, who was a labor economist, uh, we really didn't use the other members of the management okay. side. Okay. And the, the first... Uh, program, the master's program we offered, uh, we did have input from uh, the economics department in terms of quantitative work from Stan Ryder and uh, I think uh, I think the uh, economics course from Vern Smith, who you know later became a Nobel laureate. Right. And um, and I think even M. Weiler, I think, taught a course. Okay. Uh, and we had Don King from industrial economics uh, teaching a course. So uh, that was our faculty the first uh, uh, year or so, and then later on it evolved. Sure, uh, okay. The problem that we had at the time was that the School of Industrial Management and Transportation was still in the engineering schools. Oh, it was look, and that is in theory, on paper. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it actually was right in the same building, Stanley Kohler Annex, along with the economics department. And M. Weiler was the head of both departments. Unfortunately, the budget, however, was still in the uh, SEH, so we had this sort of split uh, dichotomy in which the budget was in one <laughs> right. under that dean, and uh, our promotions were in engineering under another dean. Sure. <clears throat> well, that went on for a couple of years, and it was just two years, as a matter of fact. And then uh, M. Wiley had been asked by the Wharton School to do a uh, study of some problems the school was having, and as you might expect, he did a, a super job. And the end result, they asked, would he like to become dean at Wharton? Well, that was quite a, an honor, actually, because Wharton, as you know, is one of, one of the top schools in the country. And one of the older ones, too. And one of the older ones. Sure. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, one of the residents here at uh, Rivermead was the first woman graduate from Wharton. <laughs> oh my lord, what, what a small world. <laughs> right. So at any rate, uh, M. marched up to uh, 
President Abdi and said, uh, you know, uh, I have this opportunity. I don't want to leave. I love my new house I've built up there on the banks above the Wabash. Uh, but frankly, this, this is a ridiculous organization we have now, and let's put it together as a school of, uh, of industrial management. And uh, Abdi agreed, and the original intent was that the industrial engineering, which was sort of a, an orphan of the engineering school, uh, and uh, economics and industrial management transportation would form the new school. Well, the first thing that happened was the engineers said, hey, no, we don't want to be over with them, those guys. We want to stay right in the engineering school where we are. Mm -hmm. So that ended that. And then uh, the second thing that happened was the dean, whose name I can't remember, and I should, of SEC said, well, if you form this new school, you can't have your st undergraduate students. Would that have been Murray Ogle? No, that would oh. be... Oh, he would come after. Ogle. Okay, okay. All right, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, and the uh, <laughs> uh, and the uh, result was that uh, we had to agree that we would leave the 500. We had the undergraduate program at that time was called industrial economics, and uh, it was sort of a semi-business, semi-economics kind of program. And uh, so we agreed to leave that in the, his school for registration purposes even though we would design the curriculum and teach the curriculum. <laughs> so, it works. So we ended up uh, with the industrial management and the Department of Economics and the new School of Industrial Management uh, with uh, no undergraduate program. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> things were going along in, well in economics too. We haven't brought in these real hot shot assistant professors just out of school that were uh, educated in the, the latest uh, use of mathematics and statistics to economic analysis, and uh, was st they were starting to make a name for themselves. And lo and behold, we were able to get uh, a, uh, and was able to get a, I think it was a hundred dollars $200,000 grant, I forget the amount, but it was a sizable amount for us to uh, underwrite a PhD program in economics. Wow. And so at the very early stages uh, of the economics department, uh, we did have those, those two advantages of the PRF, uh, uh, Purdue, PR, Purdue Research Foundation and the uh, Ford Foundation a grant to help us along. The, uh, I uh, continue to teach uh, finance. Uh, uh, I had to teach the first the term of um, management financial control because John C. hadn't arrived yet that, that first fall and uh, I got very good teaching notices but I, I can't refrain from saying that after having my uh, spirits raised by two very complimentary comments the third one was the only comment on the third one was it's a good book <laughs> <laughs> how I like the, that <laughs> how to deflate in a hurry at any rate uh, the, uh, uh, at the end uh, and you may, I'm, I'm sure you, maybe you know, uh, but the reason we use this term Indust School of Industrial Management uh, was the, the political problem. Uh, uh, President Hubdi uh, knew that he was going to have a real battle with uh, IU if he set up a, uh, a, what they would consider a competing business school. Okay. And a matter of fact, there was a certain amount of discussion back and forth uh, uh, whether or not we would... Uh, take the name of business, uh, which of course it was, uh, sure. but uh, eventually we ended up by pointing out that we were, uh, this master's program was concentrating on engineers and science major undergraduates and really wasn't a direct competition to IU and right. eventually uh, that all passed. Sure. Um, the, uh, at the end of uh, the third year, the Ford Foundation offered an opportunity for us professors who had been gotten our doctorates in the older programs uh, to, un to undertake a one-year study of statistics and mathematics as applied to uh, uh, research in, uh, and, uh, and control in, uh, in businesses. And uh, uh, we competed for the positions. Uh, there were 40 positions open, and uh, I was fortunate enough to win one of them. And, Congratulations. Uh, I had that on my list. I was going to ask you about that. It's a and, nice opportunity. It was great for you. Well, and uh, uh, they agreed to pay half my salary, and but the university had to agree to pay the other half, which they did with mm -hmm. no problems. Yeah. 
Were you, so was I, your family able to go with you? Yes, I okay. moved the whole family back east and rented a uh, uh, half of a two two family house in this within a block of where I lived before. Oh, <laughs> so you were doing it in in Massachusetts then? Right, right. Okay. The, the, uh, the the program was being held at the business school, although the professors were not necessarily from the business school. Uh, uh, okay, all right, thank you. And it was a, an excellent program. Uh, frankly, uh, I wasn't really excited about it. Uh, I'm not mathematically inclined. Uh, I'm super good at in case discussion or analysis, but <laughs> in terms of working with a formula, I don't do that well. At any rate, uh, uh, I'd only been there a couple of months when I got a call from him Wireless saying, John, he said, uh, uh, this this thing is getting to the point where we've got to have a better organizational structure. And he said, what I've decided upon is I'm going to have two associate deans. And he said, I'd like you to be the one working with the faculty in the budget. And Ron Stuckey will be the one for outside uh, recruiting and uh, uh, student uh, uh, evaluation and care. And so I agreed. And when I came back uh, uh, after one year, I uh, took the job as associate dean and also uh, continued to teach. Sure. And uh, but we had a excuse me, I just dropped my pencil. We had a a situation uh, where our school was organized in a completely different fashion than the rest of the uh, the uh, schools. We had no department heads, and I had. Uh, advocated and uh, M had finally agreed to, we set up, each department had what we call a policy committee made up of senior faculty. And they, and they uh, set all of the requirements for the curriculum and, and, and grades and everything having to do with students and the actual teaching of the courses. Right. Much like a department head would to some extent. Right. Okay. But the budget remained under the central control. Okay. And that meant that we could take and f funnel money either to one way or the other, sure. depending upon where we wanted to put uh, the pressure at the moment to increase our uh, quality or the number of faculty and so forth. Sure, I understand. Um, I, I was a little unhappy to read that Cossier, present dean, had done away and put in department heads. No, okay. But when you put department heads, first of all, you lose three or four. Uh, teaching <laughs> yeah. classes, and uh, uh, then you get the internal squabbling that always happens between sure. departments when sure. budget time comes. I understand, yeah. Did you hear that he's stepping down? Yes, I oh, did. Oh, okay, all right. So uh, from then on, uh, I was a, um, a professor a part-time and a, an administrator part-time, um, and that went on for several years. And until one time I was offering the course in small business management, and about halfway through the course, uh, a local small businessman who had taken the course uh, came up to me after the uh, uh, course was over for the day and said, uh, Professor, he said, uh, I want to complain. He said, I took because this course because of you and your reputation, he said, but you know how many times you've been absent and some and you know, when your graduate student assistant teaches it? And I said, no, not really. I, I know I've been a few, a few times. He says, 50% of the classes you have missed so far today. So uh, I went to him and I said, Em, much as I enjoy teaching, it's obviously got to stop. I said, I, I cannot do all the other things I have to do as an administrator and still do a decent job teaching. And he agreed, and so from then on, I was full time as the associate dean. Okay, yeah. it is hard to do that, it really is. Uh, Particularly uh, because of our setup, because we had no right. department yet. That's right, <laughs> exactly. You've got the whole show. You know, the whole show, right? Right. Uh -huh. Well, in the, uh, at about this time, uh, uh, we uh, uh, had an interesting thing happen. I like to say that the Cranet schools formed on the basis of a sick cow, and uh, the reason being that uh, Fred Andrews, who was the Department of Anim head of the Department of Animal Science, was asked by the Cranets to look at Mrs. Cranets' pet hobby, a, a herd of uh, Swiss cattle. 
that had contacted some kind of a disease. And uh, Fred and his people went over there, and they uh, told Mr. Cranett that he'd have to give them con complete control of the herd for a certain period of time if he expected it to be cleared up, and he agreed. And they did the job and sure, uh, eventually cured the herd or whatever it was bugging them. Sure. And <clears throat> so Mr. Cranett, just in conversation, says, you know, he said, I wish I could find somebody like you, he said, that could uh, help with some of the kinds of problems I have in my business. <laughs> And Fred DSO uh, <laughs> took and uh, said, uh, Mr. Cranley, I'm just the man for you. So a few days later, M. Uh, M. Wyla and uh, Mr. Cranley got together. And uh, as a result, we developed a course, especially for his, his, his managers, that turned out to be pretty successful, as I understand. Uh huh. Well, good. And uh, that led to, uh, meanwhile, and while I was meeting with Mr. Cran on a number of things uh, regarding the course, and suggested, well, maybe Mr. McCran might like to think about us in, uh, endowing a school. And then uh, R.B. Stewart got in with them, and they worked together, and eventually, as you well know, uh, Mr. Cran uh, did say that. Uh, he would uh, uh, put up some money so we could build a new new building. <coughs> Excuse me. The uh, the deal, of course, and typical Mr. Cranet deal was that he wouldn't put all the money up. <laughs> We'd have to raise some money. Sure. And at that time, we estimated the, the according to the architect's drawings and so forth as about uh, three thousand dollars. And. Uh, R.B. Stewart, who was, of course, involved in all this, uh, said, you know, he said, that piece of land is too damn valuable. He said, to put up only a $3,000 four-story building. The original plan called for a main floor, uh, a second floor library, uh, third, third floor offices, third and fourth, uh, uh, third floor and fourth offices on the third and fourth. And uh, he said, what I'm going to do, he said, uh, is we're going to change the plans. We're going for a seven-story building, and the top three stories are going to be dormitories. He said, I can get borrow money from the United States government for dormitories. I can't for a classroom building, but for dormitories at 2%. And he said, uh, we'll uh, develop these uh, three floors of uh, dormitory rooms, he said, with, in such a way that they can be easily converted into offices at a later date. And he said, furthermore, in terms of the whole building, who knows when the last brick stops with a twinkle in his eyes. <laughs> uh, <coughs> so uh, that was the plan. And then, of course, Eli Lilly a Company, uh, the foundation, left that big uh, park uh, uh, to uh, uh, Purdue, which they probably turned around and sold and then made part of that money available to us so we no longer had to go with the <laughs> concept of the of the. Uh, uh, the dormitories with senior women in it. Sure, uh, gotcha. Fa faculty were really revolting. They were t they made wrote, made cartoons of police dogs got Oh, I the bet that was a to <laughs> hot topic. <laughs> so, the end. Meanwhile, uh, uh, we had always wanted the behavioral lab, but somebody else, I forget who it was, suggested we get in touch with the National Science Foundation. So uh, we had a very brilliant young man with us from Carnegie Mellon, and. Uh, he uh, sketched out what he thought would make an ideal uh, behavioral lab set up and uh, submitted it. And we asked for a million dollars, and we got, I think, about 500000 anyway, enough to do the lab. So the end result was uh, we had a, uh, oh, the other thing, of course, is <laughs> Mrs. Cranitt kept sticking her nose in. And uh, first of all, Mr. Cranitt said he didn't want any more bricks. Everything was bricks on the campus. He wanted the building to stand out. And so therefore, the architects went back to work. The first building was designed with brick and came up with the marble first uh, first floor mm -hmm. on the outside and the rest of Indiana limestone. Sure. Which turned out to be a problem and delayed us getting in the building because the Indiana limestone workers went on a strike while we were building it. Oh, whoops. <laughs> uh, so at any rate, uh, we did get the building finished and uh, I remember one of my uh, faculty members' father was in the construction business in New York City, and he came by to visit his son while the building was in, in process, and he went over and looked at it, and he said, 
he couldn't get a building built like that in, in New York. He <laughs> said the, uh, the wiring was absolutely perfect and everything about the building was first class. So that always made us feel that, good. That's right. You, you feel good when you hear those things. <laughs> right. The, uh, the classrooms were another knockoff uh, from the Harvard classrooms, uh, reduced in size. The Harvard classrooms could seat 100, and I think we were shooting for 45 or 50. I forget exactly what, but essentially it was the same type of classroom. Sure. Layout, et cetera. Right, which, mm -hmm. of course, the university was not happy with because uh, right. it takes up twice as much room per desk. as. <laughs> sure, I understand. As the, but we prevailed, and, of course, it became... Everyone wanted to use them, and we had to fight <laughs> to make sure they all remained for well, us. Is that called a little bit of space uh, to, uh, tour? To, yeah, 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 yeah. Wars. <laughs> right. Um, the uh, other side, other part of the uh, Granite Grant was a, a, a three hundred thousand uh, dollar endowment per year. But Mr. Cranner left it so that, because we, we felt at the time he would give us a safe endowment, it would probably be about a, 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 a $10 million uh, set of bonds, U.S. bonds, which, is, which are, at 3% would pay about 300000 a year. Uh -huh. But Mr. Cranner was too crafty for that. He, uh, he said, no, no. He said, I'll endow it. In the, I'll, I'll promise you to get the 300000 in cash each year, he said, but, uh, and I'll make up my mind when I want to endow it. And uh, so for several years, uh, we did, in fact, get the, the money, cash or bar, socks or whatever it was. But anyway, it was $300,000, um, which was, of course, a great aid to us in setting scholarships. And, uh, oh, yes. We, uh, several of our top professors, we, we uh, gave them an annual uh, 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 stipend of maybe sure. three or $4,000. called them Cranet professors. All right. And then uh, eventually he, uh, he announced that he was going to permanently endow it. And to our horror, he gave us <laughs> a uh, mortgage on a shopping center that, uh, in, and of course, with a tremendous high, it was a, sec it was a second, it was a wraparound mortgage, a second mortgage. So the interest rate was very, very high. But the principal was low. Oh, wow. <laughs> and M was so furious, uh, uh, M. Weiland, that uh, he said, uh, I don't know what we should do. We can't do anything about it. Uh, he, uh, he was going to go personally protest with him, and Kama uh, Voices said, uh, relax. After all, it's something. We're not going to change it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so he ended up by not getting the... Uh, the principal we expected to get, I, I think it was only a three or four thousand dollars more, actually. Okay. Uh, it's, um, three or four million more. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, then uh, what's that? Then uh, uh, things moved along. We became, uh, interestingly enough, uh, in our early stages, uh, the, the, the Chicago Tribune. Uh, uh, was so intrigued by our, by M's uh, uh, discussion and approach of the one-year program that uh, they, when they uh, an early publication, I, I would think it could have been much more than after it had been in the business for eight or nine years, uh, listed as one of the top ten schools in the country, which, of course, we didn't absolutely not <laughs> rate, <laughs> but so much for, for marketing. Sure, there you go. Uh, we'll take it. And uh, Yeah, that's right, we'll take it. Uh, you have a, a pretty good uh, uh, summary on that uh, paper I sent you, that, uh, that uh, yes, 82 yes. thing of what right. went on in the school. Right. Um, and talk a little bit about the, uh, some of the interesting things that occurred. Uh, uh, one of the things that uh, Ruth Freehaven, when she did the uh, biography of, uh, of Abby Stewart, uh, I don't know if you've read it or not, but I've glanced at it, sir, but I have not read it uh, cover yeah. to cover. Uh, I'm aware of the publication, though. She uh, neglected, uh, I think, interviewing some of the people like myself who knew something about R.B. at least in terms of his relationship at Purdue. Mm -hmm. And when he was uh, retiring, he called me up and said he would like me to serve on a committee that would review the position 
of the manager of the Purdue Research Foundation and its relationship to the university. At that time, the uh, vice president and treasurer of the university also was a direct manager of PRF. Oh, okay. So it was a uh, dual, same person with the dual responsibilities. Exactly, exactly. And so uh, I went over and talked with, with him and uh, got together a small committee. And I think, I'm pretty sure I chaired it. Uh, and the end result was that we uh, produce a, obviously a written report and a recommend must be someplace in the university files. Uh, that suggested the, that the manager of the Purdue Research Foundation ought to be a separate entity uh, so a manager could devote full time to it, and that, uh, uh, and that the present structure of the university uh, really needed, the top structure really needed to uh, be uh, reorganized. And as you recall, at that time, uh, we had the vice president and treasurer uh, but then we had sort of a, uh, what did you call him, a senior dean? I can't think of his name uh, now. That's okay. Uh, and uh, that was it. Oh, okay. And uh, you as a fact, you as a dean would, re uh, would uh, react to the senior dean over there. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, but uh, that was all the staff that Hubby really had. And, uh, so we recommended that the that be a vice presidential structure be uh, developed, and that uh, the, in addition to the vice president and treasurer, there be a vice president for academic affairs, and of course later on became the provost, a vice president for student affairs, and I think we recommended a vice president for, uh, for student housing and uh, and things like the student center and so forth, uh, and it was accepted by Hefty. Good. And the Board of Trustees. Okay. So uh, there was a contribution that he made that uh, was never, never mentioned, actually. It was, it was the guy who made it possible for the first change in the top structure of the mm. university. That's interesting. Yeah, that's good uh, to know. The, uh, furthermore, uh, after he retired, uh, R.B., uh -huh. uh, we gave him a, 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 uh, one of our best offices in the Cranor Building, and for a while he sort of worked out of there doing whatever he did until he retired to Florida. But it was very interesting that uh, uh, he, uh, when he got his honorary degree from Purdue, the only two people he invited from the Purdue group to go back and sort of celebrate with him in his home uh, after the uh, affair was over was M. Weiler and myself. <laughs> And, and our wives. Sure. Course. How nice. Uh, now, he lived at Westwood, what's known as Westwood. Right. Okay, he, that was his home. Yeah, he, uh, of course, donated that to the university. Correct, yeah. Um, he was a controversial figure, and uh, in many ways, as far as the faculty were concerned, most faculty didn't like him because he stuck pretty closely to what he considered to be the cost-effective <laughs> method of operation. For example, the faculty hated the architecture of Purdue. I say the faculty, I'm talking in general. You know, sure, I right? understand. All right. And they called it modern penitentiary. <laughs> <laughs> and or the red brick something or other, <laughs> right? There you go. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, he uh, held fast. He used the same uh, uh, architects right here in, uh, right sure, there in Lafayette. Right. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, I got a real discounted price for all the work he threw them compared to if he went out and had other architects do it. That's it right, nice. yeah. And on and on and on, uh, uh, the word was when I first got there, and em, em had told me this, that uh, in the very early stages of uh, Mr. Uh, of uh, Fred Hubby becoming president, uh, there was an argument uh, regarding uh, a budget matter or an expenditure matter or some kind of, it had to do with dollars anyway. And uh, so R.B. said, well, you know, Prexy, we just got to settle this. Uh, uh, so they went to the Board of Trustees, and this is all hearsay now. I'm, I'm not, it's not the first person talking now. Sure, I understand. And uh, I guess he, they presented their case, and I, the trustees made it very clear that from, it, uh, when it had to do with dollars, R.B. was supreme. <laughs> he was the chief honcho, huh? Yeah, he yeah. was the chief honcho, and right. it had to do with dollars. Sure. And 
little things cropped up over the years that are sort of interesting or outside of the normal run of the uh, operation. Uh, I can't think of the name of the head of our board of trustees for years. Uh, oh, gosh, I remember I visited him several times. Oh, uh, uh, Powers? Has it been John pa well, it been Powers, Don Powers, or before no. him? Uh, Maybe? Okay. Oh, gosh, what was his name? Uh, had a lovely home with an indoor swimming pool. I remember that. Okay. Well, uh, when you when you get the transcript, you can insert it. That's okay. I don't have the list in front of me, but uh, that's all right. Go ahead. And uh, at any rate, he came to me and he said, "You know, uh, John," he said, uh, "We really are overlooking someone." He said that really deserves to be uh, given an honorary degree. He said he and uh, he, he said, as president of Lafayette National Bank, he said, during the Depression, he came to our rescue more than once with loans, he said, that no bank uh, probably should have made during that period of time. Uh, he said, he and I, these two are close, and uh, they work together, and he said, uh, we really owe a lot to him. And I said, well, uh, I can't think as I say, you know, I said, we do have a problem. And he said, what's the problem? He said, well, I don't know whether you know it or not, I said, but I was told uh, in the early stages of being an associate dean that we couldn't recommend anybody locally because we didn't want to start a competition as to who would get an honorary degree from Purdue from the local populace. And uh, I never heard that, he said. Well, I said, I don't know whether it's true or not, I said, but uh, you should check into it. <laughs> <laughs> so he... Uh, he uh, did check in and come back, and he said, well, whatever it is, he said, I'm not buying it. And uh, he said, if, you, if you, you and your faculty will recommend him for a doctor of management, he said, uh, I would be most grateful. So we did. <laughs> oh, that's nice. It worked out then. It worked out. Sure. Right. From, uh, from then on, they didn't follow that again. Right, that, yeah. If, uh, the other people got, local people got to it. Sure. Well, uh, then we can move on. Uh, then you became the dean. You want to make some comments on that when you well, were the dean? Think, yeah, that is sort of interesting because I'm, I was the last dean ever directly appointed by the president without consulting the faculty. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, but you have to know that M. Weiler and I had this wonderful working relationship. Yeah, you've indicated that, and I've heard from others as well. You know. Yeah, and. Uh, uh, so even so much so that we got equal salaries. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's because they haven't decided that you want to give equal salaries to us. And uh, so for the last two or three years before M retired, I was running the school. Uh, M was completely involved with Mr. Cranham. By this time, he had become a member of the board and a member of the executive committee and so forth. Mr. Cranham had granted him uh, ten thousand shares of st well stock and then arranged for a bank loan so that, uh, which Mr. Cranitt supported so that he could pay for them and this kind of thing. So sure. he was deeply involved with the Inland Container Corporation. Right. And he also wanted to do a book, which he did, and he just decided that this was, he was no longer really interested in trying to be dean of the school when he actually hadn't been very much of a dean for the last three years, two or three years. Sure, I understand. And of course, the faculty were used to working with me. The one exception was that these young, hotshot e economics assistant professors that he hired when he first was headed the Department of uh, Economics, uh, if they had a problem, they'd go to him. Well, that's understandable. He was their father confessor. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Um, that didn't bother me a bit. No. Yeah. And they were more familiar. He was more familiar with economics probably than right, you were right. anyway. Well, actually, of course, the problems they took to were, up, were personal. They oh, yeah, they well. seldom were professional. One on one, on one right. Right. <laughs> and uh, so uh, he recommended to President Hubby strongly that I be appointed dean. And Hubby agreed uh, as he, because he was, actually, Hubby was, when he was talk, asking questions about the school, would call me directly. And the one time I got into trouble with him was, how do you call me up and, and asked uh, um, if I were interested in talking with some people, I think from Michigan, who were talking to get put together a program down in one of the South American countries, which one I, uh, Central American countries, which one I can't remember now, uh, a joint program with them, and which uh, 
Purdue and uh, the School of Management and the School of Business at uh, Michigan and one other school would cooperate in, in uh, helping develop a program and maybe sending visiting professors and so forth. And I said, sure, I'm very interested in looking into it. So uh, I did. And as uh, <clears throat> time marched along, progress didn't seem to be uh, working in, in a forward direction. And uh, eventually I came to the conclusion that this was just a boondoggle that was not going not to come to fruition. And next thing I knew, maybe a couple of months after uh, I first started working with the people in Michigan, M came into my office and he was pretty upset. He said, John, what is this thing about South, this deal with South America and Michigan and so forth? <coughs> I hadn't told him a word about it. Mm -hmm. Says that Hubdi at a cocktail party had asked him about how it was going <laughs> 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 and how it. So I apologized profusely, and that was the only time in our entire relationship that there was ever any. And sure. of course, he, he, he's not the kind to hold a grudge against it. He realized that I what happened. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, that was it. The only thing Hubdi said was, uh, I don't want to do it now. This is like in October. I want to do it the first of the year. <coughs> so. I became dean. As I say, I think I'm sure I'm the last dean that Purdue was ever appointed without faculty consultation. Yeah. But he didn't have to consult the faculty. I've been working with him for three years. Sure, right. And uh, th th I'm sure that some of the people that I'd gotten I'd hired over the years uh, were the types who, if I weren't doing a good job, would sure as hell would bring it up to the powers to be. They, they, uh, they'll talk about it. Well, incidentally, yeah, I should. Sure back step a little bit and say that one of the things that that program, that math program <coughs> in Boston did for me, it introduced me to s several top faculty. <coughs> and as soon as I got back, I had my ears out uh, and uh, I heard that there might be an interest on part of one of the people in marketing to uh, look around. And uh, so I went after him and offered him a, a, a good deal. And then the, there was another one equally good, and so I thought probability of getting both of them is zero, so uh, uh, not more than 50%, so I better make offers to two of them. So even though I only had money for one position, I made offers to two of them. And <coughs> one of them, uh, Mike Bessema, called me up and said, John, he said, uh, I've been thinking, uh, uh, he said, I know you've made an offer, I, I've been made an offer to Frank, he said. I'm not sure, he said, I want to be in a place where I'm competing head-on with Frank. And he said, so make up your mind, offer it to one or the other. And, uh, well, I said, uh, Mike, uh, let me think about that. I said, I don't think you have to worry about that. Uh, there's enough room here for two top people like yourself in marketing. <clears throat> and furthermore, you're not exactly in the same part of fields of marketing. Well, he wasn't convinced, and so I... Well, I said I let it simmer for a while. Sure enough, three or four days later, he said, I've been talking with Frank. Unless you make offers to both of us, we, neither one of us will come. <laughs> <laughs> so I got both of them oh. and then had to scrounge around. Then another word I got was a, that uh, a Bob uh, Johnson in finance up at Michigan State wasn't very happy with the dean up there. And uh, so I went after Bob, and sure enough, I got him. Yeah, That's a credit and, research center. What's that? The Credit Research Center. Yeah, and it, he brought the Credit Research Center with him. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I got 10 percent of the of the, fa of the of the student group at the IBMAP, which is what we call it, uh, there in Harvard, uh, ended up at Granite. <laughs> oh, very nice. That's nice. It worked out for you. Yeah, sure did. And of course, Frank Bass became the leading uh, researcher in, in quantitative uh, marketing in the country. So I. Right. Yeah. So at any rate, uh, uh, as dean, uh, I did a number of things that, uh, oh, for example, I, uh, I started for the first time outside fundraising through uh, the uh, businessmen advisors to the school. I set up a committee of businessmen advisors to the school, and generally each one of them brought in at least a thousand bucks. So <laughs> that Sound. helped. Okay. Uh, I hired a very controversial figure who. Uh, was out beating the bushes for this kind of thing, and uh, he, uh, <laughs> he he was so controversial that uh, uh, Fred McLemore was his name that uh, he uh, t 
turned one of the trustees against me. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, <clears throat> well, I won't go into that, but yeah. it was a political, so, yeah. Republican political problem. Okay. Uh, what, and, about the, uh, uh, didn't you, what about the business opportunity program, Cornell Bell? Yeah, I was Cornell Bell. Right, and you, do, you started that in, during your tenure yeah. as a dean. And I think I told you I'm sending you a video that I did. Yes, that. okay, that's great. That'll be fine. Uh, yeah, uh, Cornell was a... Uh, was uh, my idea. Uh, and actually, the idea of the business opportunity program sprung out of a group of faculty who, right after <coughs> excuse me, Martin Luther King's assassination, came to me and said, you know, it's ridiculous. These, these youngsters out of Gary and Indianapolis and so forth, uh, Afro back blacks as we called them then, Afro-Americans. Right. Uh, <coughs> he said, when they come to Purdue, they go into the, either the, the uh, the athletic department and try to get fame as a, as a top player in some sport, or they go over to SEH and uh, study uh, soft sciences of some type, social sciences of some type or another, which doesn't do a bit of good when they go out looking for a job. Sure. <clears throat> and uh, they, uh, uh, they, they said, we we're going to make a proposition to you. We'll put up uh, 500 bucks a piece, and I think there were 10 of them. Uh, and uh, to support a summer program to, to do some remedial work so these kids will have a chance of success in the freshman year. And uh, uh, we'll give it the PRF. And they said, of course, if, uh, if uh, worst comes to the worst, we'll take a tax deduction, but frankly, we expect you to raise the money to pay us back. <laughs> <laughs> we got a deal for you. Yeah, typical faculty. <laughs> to make a long story short, we started the program. We didn't know what the devil we were doing. Uh, the first program uh, had 11 students, and uh, by the end of the year, one of them had left us to study poetry over in SEH. Uh, uh, another had... Uh, uh, joined the army, and the third one had gotten into trouble with the police. So all in all, we, <laughs> we didn't do too well. And, but we uh, started. What's that? You started. We started. So uh, I, I, one of the uh, faculty members who had met Cornell in their recruiting, uh, the faculty did the recruiting for this first program, uh, said this is a hotshot guy up there at uh, Gary Tollison, I think it was, anyway, one of the high schools. And uh, we were really impressed with him. So I contacted him. and. Uh, Asked if you maybe take a leave of absence and spend, I don't know, I can't a term or a year with us, which he agreed to do. And he came down and uh, got us started in the right direction. And, for example, he pointed out that uh, our selection was based on emotion rather than analysis of, of the pr prospective student. And that we were bringing kids in who might have a glib tongue, but... Uh, were in the bottom half of their high school class. And he said, you don't bring any students into your school. He said, you know, we're white in the bottom half of their class. Sure. <laughs> and at uh, any rate, the following year, we did all right, but it wasn't very satisfactory. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so the end result was uh, I was able to talk him into coming down and uh, uh, used uh, powers of persuasion, like uh, uh, I would meet his salary up at the school uh, by giving him an associate professor to start instead of an assistant professor, and uh, I, uh, he was working on his Ph.D. at uh, IU, uh -huh. and I said, I'll work with the Department of Education. I'm pretty sure I'll be successful in getting them to agree to transfer all of your credits up from IU to a Ph.D. at uh, Purdue uh -huh. in education. And I said, you furthermore, so you'll be on the campus, and any pro courses you have to do, you just go next door take the course, and uh, I said, uh, will you move down here? He said, no. I said, well, how about uh, renting an apartment? Uh, uh, maybe we'll maybe take that into consideration in your salary. I don't recall whether we did or not, but we talked about it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and uh, you come arrive on Monday morning from Gary, and you leave Friday afternoon to go back to Gary. So uh, that was what we worked out, and it was highly successful, and of course, uh, with some support from me. We built the probably the best undergraduate program in the country. Very uh, well known. And uh, uh, and then, of course, eventually he got involved in the uh, the master's program. Sure. And uh, did a tremendous recruiting job for us there, some really first-class students. Mm -hmm. and that. So 
All in all, he was a tremendous addition to the uh, right. To and our I should I I did make I should tell you that I did touch base with him, and I tried to interview him. This was about maybe a year or so ago, and he was not in the. He said no, I don't think so. I said well, I could do it by phone, and he said no. And then, oh, as you know, he since passed away, unfortunately. Right. But his papers are coming to the archives. Right. So right. they're in the they're in the process now of getting them uh, processed and whatever. So well, you know, I don't he was a. Uh, uh, and I've met him on several occasions. Nice person. And not only was he a, uh, a, a good professor for the particular job we had in right, Manhattan. Yeah. Uh, did, did really we, well. I had some problems. I did have problems, but I had some some remarks from faculty about him, uh, which were negative. But yeah. uh, I was always able to interpose myself between anything that uh, we can we can work it through. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm. And uh, so the uh, I, I introduced the uh, idea of a, uh, a couple of uh, uh, students from the uh, uh, undergraduate uh, student council uh, uh, to have non-voting seats in the faculty meeting so they could report back what was going on. I introduced the idea of, uh, of uh, the uh, uh, students. Uh, what are they, they going to say now? Uh, well. I did a, a number of things which were a step up uh, in the, in, shall we say, the student relationships. For example, uh, after we formed our school, uh, I was a person who worked with them, eventually saying, "Look, politically, we don't have a leg to stand on. How would we ever, if anybody in the state legislature, a friend of IU, got the nosing around and say, how come uh, Purdue doesn't have an undergraduate program?" Uh, you know, you, you're, not, you're not spending your money uh, to Purdue to run only a graduate program. <laughs> I understand. And uh, so we decided we needed another graduate program. So I participated in forming that. Okay. Uh, in fact, I was chairman of the committee to form it, and uh, we came up with the BSIM, which was another very unique program. Sure. Okay. And, uh, the, uh, in fact, my son graduated from it. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. <laughs> so. Uh, as the uh, time went on as dean, I, uh, I became involved with uh, uh, outside activities, as you might expect the dean would be. Sure. And, uh, uh, eventually, after uh, uh, school had uh, begun to gain some notoriety, and uh, nine, ten years had passed, I said, well, like I am, I think the time has come for me to step, step aside. And so I went to uh, Art Hansen and said, Art, uh, I think it's time for me to go back to the classroom. Uh, uh, will uh, you accept my resignation as of next, uh, this was in, in the June, and as of next June, that'll give you a whole year to find somebody to replace me. He said, John, I'm not accepting your re re resignation. You're one of our valued deans. You've done a wonderful job over there. And uh, uh, spend the summer doing whatever you're doing, he said, and uh, come back in the fall and we'll talk about it. So uh, <laughs> uh, I came back in the fall, and I've had a pretty good summer because I've been invited. I was president of the AACSB, which is the National Organization of Business School Deans. Sure, right. And uh, I was invited as the president to spend a couple of weeks in South Africa, and so at their expense. So uh, Barbara and I went over and spent two great weeks in there, and also spent some time in Portugal and Rome and whatever. Sure. And. Uh, Came back and I thought, well, this is the life I'm <laughs> teaching out out the rain, so I have the summers off and I can do some of this. There you go. And uh, of course, we are, by this time we had our place in Maine. So at any rate, I marched into the office and said, well, I wanted to talk to you about uh, my resignation, and see what you think about it. And he said, well, I'm going to accept it. I said, you're going to accept it <laughs> like that? <laughs> He said, yeah, he said, as a matter of fact, uh, I'll accept it on one condition. He said, you take over the job as vice president for development. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I said, oh, boy, I said, I have to think about that. Uh, uh, so I went home that night and told <laughs> Barbara was looking forward to me becoming the uh, 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 professor again and there thinking you about go. those summers. And uh, after a couple of days, I said, well, it's a new challenge, I'll take it on, and so uh, I, in fact, did, as you probably know. Uh -huh. uh, it was an interesting challenge, because under Fred Hovde, he did not believe, 
did not believe in uh, private fundraising for the university. It was okay for the uh, athletic department, but not for the university. Uh, and uh, consequently, he had never uh, supported the idea of a fundraising campaign. And uh, people were pushing, pushing, pushing him uh, at headquarters. I'm sure John Hicks was probably pushing him. Um, and so uh, towards the end of his venue, he uh, did give a half-hearted attempt. He had Earl Butts, and Earl borrowed my, uh, my assistant dean for undergraduate education, Jim Clapper, and a secretary, and that was a fundraising operation. And it was ridiculous. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so uh, uh, when the first thing Aunt Hansen did come in was to get himself a vice president for development from outside the university, who turned out not to be very successful. He came out of a small college, and he just didn't understand the power of the deans in a huge university like Purdue. Yeah. And it's a big operation. Yeah, a big operation. And if you have the deans against you, you're not going to get any place. Right. Believe me. Right. So uh, he eventually saw the wisdom of his way and, and left us to take a small, or maybe pushed out might be a better, I don't think he was fired, but I think he may have been pushed out at a smaller college. And at that time, he had as a consultant a guy who was supposed to be a specialist in, in large grants. I can't think of his name, but at any rate, uh, it turns out that they thought he would make a replacement, and so they made him the vice president of development. And interestingly enough, my wife went to work for him as an administrative assistant. Oh, <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> and because uh, I was, as I say, I was dean at that time. Sure. And uh, I was one of the deans who wrote some. Scur I wrote a scurrilous letter on one of the things they had planned as a fundraising event down in Florida. Or so poorly uh, organized and so forth. And uh, at any rate, uh, uh, Barbara said uh, he was an impossible guy to work with. He, she would lay out his schedule for the next day, and he'd come in and put it in his desk drawer and go about whatever he wanted to do. <laughs> so she was running around the phone, canceling appointments and what have you. Uh, and he'd go on these expensive trips to visit some millionaire that was going to ready to come back and write a report, and all the report would say in it was that so and so had so many paintings by this uh, uh, by this uh, painter and uh, had so much furniture of this particular period and so forth. But there was never any money coming out of it, so that's why they decided to move him aside and put somebody in who was a follow had been a former dean. Uh -huh. And my job was, as you might have guessed, was to build a new an organization, and uh, I think we were fairly successful at right. that. Well, uh, you had, you did really well. That plan for the 80s was the biggest at that time, you know, that's right. largest run, fundraising drive. And then uh, also when you stepped in, the President's Council had been established by Dr. Hansen, am I correct? Didn't yeah, he, yeah. So it, that was it, in it, place. Before I uh, came in, uh, right. uh, oh, I'm trying to think of the woman who ran that. Uh, Carolyn Gary. Carolyn, yes. Right, yeah, Carolyn. yeah. right. And... Uh, I, uh, they had, a, a, as a director of development, uh, under the vice president, uh, a man turned out to be a, a lifelong friend of mine, uh, Newt Knudsen. Oh, okay. And uh, uh, Newt had discovered this guy was a real faker and had essentially told him so, Newt being a retired Navy captain. And uh, so uh, there was a considerable animosity between the two of them and apparently uh, this guy and I can't think of his name he comes from Maine mm -hmm. uh, had reported to John Hicks uh, that, uh, that uh, he really felt Newt didn't belong in the job and uh, when I, one of the first things Newt, uh, John told me when I came aboard I was talking about coming aboard he said now he said uh, Newt may be a problem he said and if you uh, need to get rid of Newt uh, he said uh, you'll get the firm backing from this office well, uh, of course, it turned out to be the other way around. That the guy that they were getting rid of was a problem, not Newt. <laughs> and uh, uh, as I say, he became uh, a very good friend and uh, fi finally retired down to Buford, where I retired. Okay. Uh, the uh, we were successful. Uh, had a lot of tough missionary work to do. Uh, the uh, 
fact of the matter is that since the, the, the alumni had never been asked for money, they, they sort of said, why are you coming around and asking for money now, you know? Sure. You never it's asked a whole new people. ballpark. whole new ballpark. Right. And so we had this damn missionary job to do as well as a fundraising job. We ne I think the largest gift we had was a million and a half dollars. <laughs> And I had a good connection, a former Harvard Business School professor was the vice president of General Motors. And, and I know General Motors had the second largest number of graduates from any schools from Purdue. Right. So um, I got in touch with him and said, essentially said, you know, it'd be nice to get a million dollars from you. And he said, well, that's possible. And he said, I'll bring it up. And uh, I, I reminded them of the Purdue grads they had and so forth. Mm -hmm. And the executive vice president also was very friendly with us. I can't think of his name, too. Um, and was a, a sort of a behind-the-scenes supporter of, uh, of us. I know during the campaign, he went to bat for us with DuPont. He actually went down with us to DuPont. Uh, and when they were hesitating about making any kind of a gift, he said, you guys know how much paint we buy from DuPont. <laughs> <laughs> you need consultants like that, resources. So, yeah, we yeah. got a gift. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So at any rate, uh, 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 he, uh, he raised it, and uh, we got the, the letter. I got the letter saying that uh, uh, we had the million-dollar grant. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I told uh, I, Hanson about it. He said, well, John, he said, I'll, I'll have to go and meet with him and thank them and so forth. And so I called my friend up. And he said, John, he said, tell President Hanson. He said, we don't need his presence here. <laughs> the gift is already made. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. And we know you, we know you want to th you, you, you thanked us with a very and nice And you're letter. appreciative, right. We and know. Uh, that's all. So I told him, I said, I'm saving you a trip. Well, he wasn't too impressed with that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear! And uh, the uh, the whole uh, setup of building a a uh, a list of, uh, of donors, uh, prospective donors, and so forth. I did have a a consultant uh, that uh, they had hired before I came on the, uh, on the Gene Anderson, and uh, he was a valuable help to us. Sure, right. Uh, his boss was uh, just a pain in the neck. He came and drank cocktails and. Uh, at the restaurant there up in the bypass and uh, spent the rest of his time telling us how great he was and didn't do a damn thing for us. But anyway, Gene did. It sure. worked out well. Okay. And uh, there was a lot of learning going on uh, uh, by people. For example, Phil Haas, who was the provost at that time, um, it was a year in which the university, the state legislature cut off our funds. Uh, you know, they were in trouble up in Indianapolis. And so we were on a pretty tight budget. In fact, there was a 5% cut in the budget. And uh, so Phil was bemoaning the fact that some of his top professors, he couldn't, uh, uh, you know, give them a raise, and he was afraid people were going to raise him and so forth. So what he said that some of the funds that we had already committed to us, uh, uh, on the thing he wanted to spend them on raises. <laughs> so, mm. And one had been committed from the Kresge Foundation on the basis of an actual uh, uh, temporary blueprint that we had, uh, <clears throat> had shown them of, of this prospective life sciences lab that we are going to build. And uh, then he, and uh, so Phil argued very strongly with us that any, anything that wasn't, wasn't uh, re restricted to anything. And we said, Phil, you know, we can't do this. These people think that we're going to use it for faculty, for um, uh, helping students, uh, or building a building or something, and I said they don't, they don't, they really don't give it to us for faculty raises. And so <laughs> he kept after it, and finally, uh, uh, Fred and I were on one side, Fred Ford and I were on one side, and finally, uh, uh, Art said, Phil, if you think I'm going back to all those companies where I went hat in hand to plead for this money for certain things, and tell them, guess what, we've changed our minds. She says, you don't think right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, that was the end of the discussion. Yeah, step in then. Okay. One other little thing that was sort of interesting in my career there was the fact that I was a, a vice chairman and chairman of the Student Appeals Board. Oh, okay. And uh, somewhere in my file I have a, a letter of, that I wrote to uh, 
oh, I don't know, someone in the central administration uh, about uh, one of the appeals hearings that we sat through. And uh, there was one that I'll never forget because what it was that the SDS was towards the end of their uh, regime period on the campus. Then was the last year, actually. And uh, they had uh, brought in one of these uh, way out liberal uh, uh, types. Uh, it was it gave uh, questionable speeches, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, and uh, but uh, we weren't trying to buy them or anything. But we did have a requirement that uh, that uh, where he would interfere with some classes, students had to go around and get a faculty release on it. And uh, uh, so they appointed, uh, the, the, the SDS appointed the student to do that, and he did spend the better part of an afternoon, but he didn't get it finished. So the next morning he was going to get up early and turn to the early morning classes and get it done, and he overslept, a <laughs> typical student. Yeah. And uh, the end result was that they held their meeting uh, in front of the, over in the, uh, the uh, Memorial Center under the big... Uh, picture there that we have and it turned out hardly anybody showed up mm. so they decided to move on to a smaller room and so on their own they went over to the memorial center or to the uh, student center and took over an empty room and that turned out not to be too big so they took another little little one i don't think they had more than 15 20 people there oh wow <laughs> so the dean of Ann decided to uh, put them on uh, to deprive the SDS of uh, student organization rights based because they hadn't lived within the rules of the university. And of course he'd been out to get them. <laughs> Everybody knew that for I don't know how long. So at any rate, the, the appeal came up before the appeals board and uh, I guess I was chairing it at that time. And we listened to it and it, it clearly, you know, he really didn't have much of a leg to stand on. It was uh, pretty, pretty clear that these were technical kinds of problems, rather sure. than. So uh, the appeals board had a, uh, uh, a an engineer, assistant dean, a senior woman faculty member who was quite conservative, myself, and two honor students. And they were first-rate youngsters. So. Uh, the vote came after with, whether we had uh, sustained the dean's uh, order or not, and the two students uh, voted yes. I know we should not. But they said, "Look, each one of us has, has made a problem like this, has done a problem like this before. We've missed getting a dotting the i's and crossing the t's and this kind of thing." And they said, "Nobody ever called us on it." And uh, they said, "We think this is a clear case of out to get somebody." So the other two conservative faculty, a faculty member and assistant dean, they voted we to sustain the assistant, the uh, uh, the assistant dean of men, a dean of students. So uh, I, I I had got of the deciding vote. They said, you know, I'm I'm going to have to go with the students on this one. I said, I don't know, uh, I don't like to go against you two fine members of the faculty. I said, but the simple fact of the matter is, I think they're right in this case. And what we do is we give them a stern warning. If it occurs again, out they go. So uh, <laughs> would you believe it? That night there was a cocktail party, in which I attended. Uh, and Prexy was there, Havdi was there. And uh, John, he said, how did that thing come out? How did it work out? I said, well, we found for the students. Yes, yes. You did what? <laughs> how, in, how in the devil do you... And he was smoking a cigarette, and he was so mad, it was, his hand was trembling. And I said, Frexy, I said, the dean of men really didn't have much of a case. I said, uh, technically, you might say uh, they broke a, a couple of rules because they were lax, but the fact of the matter is the students do this all the time when you don't fire them, uh, ban them from, uh, from activity. Mm. Well, he stomped off mad. Anyway, I don't see how you could ever do that, Dean. He said, stomped off. But, you know, it turns out that they, SDS, had, had made the signs and gotten the groups together and they're going to parade the following day saying the Student Appeals Committee is unfair, it's just like everything else in the 
uh, Central University. They don't represent the students, <coughs> so forth and so on. Turns out, of course, they couldn't. <laughs> they, just, right. they, had, they not, had nothing to say. Right. And would you believe it, next fall, SDS did not appear on campus. <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, to back to the uh, <coughs> vice president's job, uh, the, uh, the end result was at the time I left the office, we, I, when I got to be 65, and they had an automatic, for senior executives, uh, they had an automatic uh, 65 uh, and retire. Uh, uh -huh. And uh, so uh, I uh, said that I would like to go back to Cranet, of course I was, at, I, I, I was a professor with tenure too. Sure. And uh, resume teaching again. And uh, uh, the, 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 uh, we had a new president coming in then, I think. A guy had just left. At any rate, uh, the end result was that uh, uh, John Hicks uh, came to me and said, you know, he said, perhaps he would like you to stay on for at least another year. And I said, I've uh, got a new assistant. Newt Knudsen had retired by that time. I've got a new assistant. And I said, and I think he can handle it until you make up your mind what you want to do for the vice president's job. And uh, unfortunately, I had, uh, at the time I became a, a vice president for development, I had worked with Phil and, and Art Hansen and said, these are the terms that I would like to come in on. For example, I'd like the office that the, I would like to give him the title of uh, a Cranet professor uh, and have the office that the Cranet professor has had for years. Uh, first, uh, it was Mr. Cranet himself, and then later on in Weiler when he retired. And uh, I mean, he may, I should say he stepped down as, uh, as mm -hmm. and uh, oh, several other things in terms of salary and so forth, to which they agreed all of it. And, and, I, and Phil had said he would notify the dean of the requirement of the office and so forth. And sure enough, when I uh, returned to teaching, they uh, uh, did give me the title of uh, Cranach Professor of Management. But the office they had converted into a, some kind of a student advising center, and uh, the, the dean at that time wasn't particularly crazy to give it up. However, he was replaced by another dean by the time I got over there, whom I knew very well, and been a former faculty member. And he said, John, we'll arrange it that you get it. Well, I said, I'm not going to take it. So I, I did, would, uh, would have liked it, I said, but frankly, uh, I said, I'm not going to make you arrange a whole, whole uh, operation. You've got settled in there. I said, I'll take another office upstairs, which is what I did. All right, okay. And uh, for a couple of years, I uh, taught. Uh, I actually went on a a sabbatical, the first term and the second term. I was visiting Professor William and Mary. Then they came back and taught for a year. And at that time, you, you still had the 70 forced retirement of all faculty. And uh, I was 68 by this time, and I thought, well, you know, why hang on? <laughs> Right. Uh, well, I, I've got enough tucked away so I can live comfortably, and, uh, uh, and Barbara would like to go to South Carolina and take up our place we had bought there eight or ten years before. And so that's what happened. Okay. Let me ask you this. We're, I, got, I don't want to hold you up too much, but we no, got no, a little I'll bit over there. Ask anything you want. Well, no, I think it's, this is fine, and I'll just, if there's just a couple things maybe in closing so that I don't hold you up because I, I try to keep it within a reasonable limit. Is that okay? Uh, so sure. go ahead. Uh, after that, and then you, you stayed in South Carolina? Yeah, we, uh, we and spent then 15 you, years in South Carolina before okay. Barbara began to show signs of Alzheimer's, and we moved up here uh, to uh, Okay. Rivermeet. Um, is, you had, but you had a place in Maine. You told me earlier. Is this the yeah, same? Yeah, I bought a place in Maine around 1965. One of my best uh, financial investments I ever made. Oh, good. <laughs> That's great. That's and, and so you kept I, it all those I years. I kept that uh, all those years, and of course sold my place in South Carolina when I came up here to Rivermead. Right. Okay. Do you like it up there? Rivermead. Yes. Oh, it's wonderful. Uh -huh. uh, you know, uh, I sh I should be so fortunate. Uh, 
the food. We have a, a award-winning chef, uh, been chef of the year twice in New Hampshire. Oh, please. And, <laughs> <laughs> well, and, uh, your wife has since passed away, though, has she? Yes. Oh, okay. she, had, uh, she had the beginnings of Alzheimer's uh, uh, about 68. And, okay. Uh, by the time we moved here in the fall, of October of 2000, uh, she was del showing definite signs of it. And, uh, oh dear. Uh, by uh, by two years, about a year and a half later, I had to finally move her over to the uh, nursing unit. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. So I lost her in the March of uh, 2004. Oh, okay. All right. Do you have any of your children that live close by at all? Yes, or? I do. My oh, son. Good. My son, who has got the BSIM from Cranet, uh, uh -huh. is an entrepreneur and uh, lives over in Hollis, New Hampshire. Oh, okay. He's the uh, CEO of the largest uh, mail order tack company selling, you know, all kinds of horse equipment and so forth. Super. In the country. Yeah. Super. He's been a horse lover ever since he got his first horse. What could be better than with that job? <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> he right. lucked out. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, you know, uh, uh, Professor Day, I want to thank you very, very much for everything, and I hope we keep in touch. Well, I, I certainly uh, enjoy talking with well, you. Well, I do, too, and I, and I appreciate it. I will finish the transcript, and I appreciate you, and I'll look forward to getting the video. Right, good enough. I think it'll, it'll be, you'll get it by email, I think. Oh, that'll be fine, whatever, but I'll look forward to it. Good and, enough. and I will be keeping in touch with you, okay? Oh, well, good enough, and I'll look forward to hearing from you. Good. Again. Thanks right. a lot now. Bye-bye. Right. And boiler up. Uh -huh. okay. okay. Bye-bye.